Space Stuff! Well, hi everyone. Welcome to Dome at Home. We had a little glitch there with our title sequence, which was a bit odd, but that's okay. Welcome to the show. We are happy to be back here for Season 2. This is uh, sort of the first one of our regular shows of Season 2. Last week during spring break, we had a special viewing of a planetarium show. Now we're back to sort of our regular format that we'll have all the way through through the end of June. So, my name is Scott Young. I'm the planetarium astronomer at the Manitoba Museum. We are... Um, getting ready to uh, deliver programs online to be able to eventually open up the planetarium that is not happening anytime soon so we're doing these virtual programs instead but something big is happening at the manitoba museum and you may have seen it in the news we have opened a brand new gallery of the museum it's called the prairies gallery it opened today and it is fantastic it's a, a space that has been in the museum for a long time. You'll probably remember the old Grasslands Gallery where there was the TP and uh, the log cabin and a few things like that. Well, we kept some of those big iconic pieces. The TP is still there, for example. But most of the rest of the gallery was completely gutted and completely redesigned from scratch. And it really does a bang up job of talking about all of the things that happen here on the, on the prairies. It is a fantastic gallery. And so I highly recommend you pop down and see it. The museum is open to the public Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And of course, proper social distancing. There are, there are certain um, capacity limits and things like that. But it's a very big space, very well ventilated. So it's a pretty, pretty decent place to come and check out. And the new gallery is fantastic. In fact, if you haven't been there for a little while, we did a new gallery just a year or so ago. Uh, the Winnipeg Gallery was brand new. And then before that, we renovated the Nonsuch Gallery and the whole area leading up to that. So there's been a lot of changes there in the last couple of years. All part of our Bringing Our Stories Forward um, major capital program, which is, which is still ongoing, as a matter of fact. So here's a couple of sneak previews of some of the spaces that uh, are in there. Brand new technology, brand new exhibits, brand new display cases, brand new flooring audio the whole deal it's it's a it's like night and day so you definitely want to swing by if you can and tonight's theme is prairie skies for that very reason we're uh, we're celebrating the opening of the prairie gallery but this really is a great place to look at the stars and so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight with me as always is mike in the comment thread hi mike how you doing I'm not too bad. I'm yourself? not too bad yourself. I'm adequate. Um, we've been uh, looking at a whole bunch of stuff over the last couple of weeks. All those videos have been coming in for the Mars landing challenge that we had out over spring break. Lots of lots of people getting involved in those. And uh, we've also we've got some drawings and things like that. Mike is the guy who basically takes care of uh, all of the incoming mail, sorts it, gets it to the right person. He's answering questions out there in the threads and passing questions on to me. So you'll be able to chat with Mike through the comments thread here on Zoom. And he'll also check in with Facebook Live and YouTube to see what we've got for questions. We've added a Q&A session to the end of the show, sort of a formal one. So if you have a big question that is, you know, something that you'd like to see some uh, some answer to on the show, save it to the end uh, or put it in the chat and Mike will maybe save it up for the, for the question series. All right, prairie skies. The great thing about the prairie skies, there's no terrain to get in the way. I mean, I spent time in Vancouver. I spent time, you know, down in uh, the southern United States, or even even out by the Appalachians in in, in the states. And there's really, I mean, mountains are nice, but they kind of block the view. You know, I'm a prairie kid through and through, and I like my big horizons and my big skies. Manitoba or anywhere in the prairies is a great place for watching the stars, and you just get these wide open vistas. And it really, I think, I think it sort of predisposes prairie folks to being uh, interested in astronomy because you you kind of can't miss the sky. We've been watching the sky, you know, if you've been with us through the first season since January, we've been watching the sky slowly change. We've had a big um, change in the last little while. When we went to daylight savings time, suddenly everything was happening an hour later. 
that coupled with the fact that the sun is actually rising later and later each each night as we go in towards summer means that the sky doesn't get dark till quite late. I know some of our younger viewers have uh, have mentioned that they can't stay up late enough to actually see the stars. But there's uh, it is it is worth it if you can do it on a weekend or a special night or or something like that. Take a nap in the afternoon if you have to, and uh, and stay up because the sky even even if you can't stay up uh, past midnight, there is some great stuff to see. In the northern sky, we've got our sort of standard constellations that we've looked at. We've got the Big Dipper is high up overhead. And um, one of the, oops, lost my head, headphone there. One of the many stories about the Big Dipper is that um, it's a dipper with water in it. And when it's high up overhead, as it is now, all the water comes out of the dipper and falls onto the earth as rain. And that uh, that certainly was happening here in Manitoba today, at least uh, across the southern parts of it. We had lots of rain. Obviously, that's not the scientific definition of where rain comes from. But the fact that the Big Dipper is high in the sky in the springtime when it's often raining is what gives that sort of correlation. Another connection between the constellations and then figuring out the seasons, figuring out the weather, figuring out what's going to happen here on Earth. Our two pointer stars in the bowl of the Big Dipper will point all the way down to the North Star, and we've got our little dipper over here. That's pretty faint, pretty hard to see from inside the city. Lots of other constellations in the area. We focused on Queen Cassiopeia for a while. She's starting to get pretty low down in the northwest. In fact, you'll notice that the sky isn't even really dark over in that part of the sky yet. We're showing the sky at, at um, 8 o'clock tonight, and frankly, that's just not late enough to have a fully dark sky. So maybe what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll just uh, give ourselves another little hour here. This program, Stellarium, is a free desktop planetarium simulator and it lets you make your own star maps and see what's up in the sky so you can you can download that and uh, basically do this whole thing yourself if you'd like but uh, once it gets dark maybe nine o'clock you can start to see the fainter stars in this part of the sky we'll swing on over to the western sky here oh, there we go in the west we can still catch the winter constellations good old orion the hunter over there oops has been, uh, you know, getting down low in the sky and disappearing quite early in the night, but it's still visible just as it's getting dark. Right next to it, Taurus the Bull, the V-shaped group of stars here, the little Seven Sisters star cluster. And then right up here in the horns of Taurus the Bull, there's the planet Mars, still visible, still hanging on after all these months. We've seen it in the sky for eight or nine months now. Now it's a shadow of what it's been in the past. It was, uh, it's quite far away from us. It's uh, quite faint. It's really fading away. It just looks like a, a regular star at this point. You might not even notice the orange color, but uh, Mars, of course, still highlighted with all the, uh, the spacecraft that are on it. The Perseverance rover has dropped off its little helicopter. The helicopter is gonna fly as early as this weekend, actually. And so we're looking forward to that. They've, uh, they're, they're gonna be doing a test I think uh, I think tomorrow actually testing the rotors just to spin it up and make sure that everything's working before they actually lift off the ground. So that'll be fun to watch. Swinging around to the southern sky. This is where in the south, this is where the seasonal constellations get to their highest. So the, the constellations we're seeing high in the south are basically the spring stars now. Just going to zoom out a bit so we can get a bit more of a view. There we go. Leo the lion that we highlighted a few uh, few weeks back is probably the major constellation at this time of the year up there in the south. A lot of the other ones are quite faint. So we have, you know, Cancer the Crab. We have Hydra, which is basically a long meandering line of really faint stars. Some of these are not easy to see, of course. It's over in the east where we start to have um, the interesting transitions coming. Uh, I think it was last week we talked about Boates the Herdsman. This is um, a herdsman, apparently. It looks like an ice cream cone with a big blob of ice cream on top to me. But the bright star Arcturus is sort of a, a harbinger of spring. You can find the, uh, the star Arcturus by using the Big Dipper, which is high up here. The arc of the handle points in an arc to Arcturus. So you can follow the arc 
to Arcturus. And actually, now that um, some other constellations have risen a little higher, we can continue that mnemonic there. It's follow the arc to Arcturus and then speed on to Spica. Spica is a bright star in the constellation, oh, right by my head there, uh, is in the constellation of Virgo the Maiden. And that's, uh, that's this constellation here. Does not look like a maiden necessarily, but that bright star is pretty easy to spot, even from inside the city. So those are some of your signposts that you can see. The exciting part, I think for me, is that right over in the Northeast, just poking up above the horizon, there's a bright star over here. This is the star Vega. It is one of the brightest stars in the whole sky. It's in the constellation of Lyra the Harp. If you watch the movie Contact, the Carl Sagan uh, with Jodie Foster in it, uh, Vega, I think, is the, the star system that the aliens came from. So if that helps you. But the great thing about Vega is it's part of the Summer Triangle. The Summer Triangle is a well-known group of stars visible in the summer sky. And this tells me when I can start to see um, Vega poking up above the horizon in the evening, I know that summer is coming. Despite the fact that the weather forecaster is telling me um, that we're going to get 10 to 20 centimeters of snow this weekend here in uh, in southern Manitoba. I know that summer is coming. And so that'll, that'll hopefully keep me going through that time frame. Okay, uh, we have a couple of uh, questions that are coming in here. Um, someone was asking about brightening the view. I haven't actually... Um, Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll see if I can brighten up the view a little bit. If you're having trouble seeing stars on your screen, you have a couple of options. One is to turn the lights off in your room if you can. And if not, turn up the brightness on your uh, your viewing device and that'll make it uh, easier. I mean, these TVs and, and phones and things are designed to show pictures of people's faces. And when you put um, bright dots against a black background, sometimes the, the auto settings don't quite work. So you can try that out uh, as well. Right up overhead, we have our Big Dipper. And there's not a whole lot else in the area of sky up there sort of worth talking about. The um, other constellations around here are quite faint. This is the, the Lynx. And this is Leo Minor, which is a small lion. Uh, again, those stars are hardly visible. So really overhead, it's the Big Dipper. And uh, so if you're in an urban setting and you have to look straight up in between buildings or whatever, the Big Dipper, that's your friend. Okay. Let us move on here to... Cool Space Stuff! This is my favorite time of the year. In April, every year, for the last, oh, decade or so at least, we have celebrated something called Yuri's Night at the Planetarium. Yuri's Night is basically a big space party that is held around the world, and all sorts of nerds like me and people that like space and people that like music and stuff get together, and we basically have a big party in honor of this fella, Yuri Gagarin, who was the first human who flew into space, all the way back in 1961, 60 years ago this year. And um, we would have a, a party in the science gallery, we'd bring in our, our uh, friend Ralph Kronig and his meteorite petting zoo, we'd have presentations and speakers, we'd have DJs in the planetarium and a star dance party and stuff like that. It was a great, great time. People would dress up in space and sci-fi costumes really really fun and it was really an excuse to get people excited about not just hey this one guy went into space but hey the species that we're all part of was able to do the impossible and leave their home planet it's about that that exploring spirit really we're not just celebrating yuri we're celebrating everybody who has ever done that kind of thing or participated in the exploration well last year uh, of course, COVID quarantine hit a few weeks before April the 12th, and so we didn't have time to do anything this year. We were hoping that there would be, you know, changes, but obviously not. There's no in-house uh, Yuri's Night party either. However, the international group that runs this is holding a large virtual event this weekend, 
So Yuri's Night 2021 will go on, and it's a great way to, to uh, tap into some of the celebrations. They are going to have all sorts of astronaut speakers, people from the space programs, people from engineering and stuff like that. There, there are, I think, 30 or 40 different guests. Bill Nye, the science guy, is going to be there from the Planetary Society. And uh, Richard Branson, who runs Virgin Galactic, where you can buy tickets to actually fly into space from all of these people that are sort of the, the movers and shakers of the space world. And uh, it's... It, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, we'll we'll pop a link to that into our uh, into our chat towards the end here. Uh, I did want to sort of go back to the origin or the original reason behind all this, though the, the fact that it's you know Yuri Gagarin, the the Russian pilot who basically went around the world once and became the most famous person uh, in the world at that point. The Russians beat the Americans, who were also racing to get a human into space, by about three weeks. So it was a very close race. Now, the spacecraft it, that poor old Yuri went into was basically uh, a two-meter diameter cannonball with a hole in one side. And inside that hole, you could basically squeeze your body in and not be able to move terribly much. The spacecraft was almost fully automatic, so he was pretty much a crash test dummy in some ways. But uh, he did, of course, experience for the first time the view of things from space. Here's, a, here's an example of what the, what the capsule was like on the inside. It's, it's pretty cramped. I don't know if you could get me into that, but still, he, he came back with some amazing stories and some amazing images. And he actually had to parachute down because his spacecraft was so close to the limit of what the rocket could do that they couldn't include a big enough parachute for the spacecraft to land with him in it and have him survive. So he basically jumped out the window before landing and parachuted down safely himself. And the spacecraft landed like a cannonball. And uh, now it's in a museum somewhere over in the, over in Russia, but a pretty amazing achievement. And it really is the, the, the beginning of a new age, the beginning of the age that humanity was no longer restricted just to our planet. As I mentioned, the Americans went uh, three weeks later with their uh, spacecraft, which is called Mercury. Now I have to say the Americans were way behind at this point. The Mercury rocket was tiny compared to the Russian one. The spacecraft was um, a little bit more advanced, but still a pretty small, like about the same size. But the flight that Alan Shepard made, he basically went up and went down. There was no going around the world. There was no anything. It was a 15 minute flight. So the, the Russians were able to get up into orbit and go 90 minutes around the earth, all the way around the earth. And then the Americans at that point, all they could manage was a 15 minute flight. And fully half of that 15 minutes was actually him parachuting down slowly at the end. So, I mean, there was not a lot of time in space. Fast forward 20 years. It was 20 years from that first cannonball style flight to the launch of the first space shuttle. Coincidentally, also on April the 12th, in this case, April 12th, 1981. This is Columbia taking off on its maiden voyage. And here we've gone from a cannonball with a person inside that's basically a crash test dummy to this gigantic space plane with um, detachable boosters that can fly into space like a rocket, carry a crew of seven people, build space stations and carry the Hubble Space Telescope and stuff like that, and then fly back and land on a runway like an airplane. And the dream was the shuttle would be able to fly so often it would be like like the passenger air service and, and people would be go able to go into space all the time. Didn't quite work out that way. Um, the shuttle had a couple of high profile incidents that uh, basically showed that it's hard to go into space. We, we might think it can be routine. We might think that we can figure out everything, but when you're leaving the planet, it only takes one little thing to go wrong before you have a really bad day. So it's um, the anniversary of both of these achievements that we will celebrate as part of Yuri's Night. And so this, the stream is uh, yurisnight.net and it's on Saturday, um, they always hold it on the weekend so that people can stay up a little later, starting at, uh, well, 6 p.m. Central Time for Manitoba. And there is a, a program available on there. You can see all the guests and all the activities. There's musical things and 
it's going to be a, a good time. So if you're looking for something to do on Saturday, there you go. Okay, let me see here. We're just going to move on to our next segment. Okay, so we have, uh, we've been getting a lot of questions in between shows from our viewers, lots of people filling out the survey and, and letting us know how they like the show, but also emailing us or, or messaging us or whatever and saying, hey, I've got this question. So we decided that we were going to just add some questions into the main show as a, a sort of a feature here so that we can make sure we get to uh, as many of them as possible. Because the odds are, if you've got a question about something, a bunch of other people probably are wondering the same thing. And rather than answering them all individually, thought it'd be good to be able to share them all. So uh, I'm going to get uh, Mike to flag me a couple of questions here. He's been checking all the threads and the social media. What do you got, Mike? Uh, my first one is actually related to your uh, um, last topic. Uh, the question is, is Yuri Gagarin still alive? Oh, great question. Um, no, he's not. He... Uh, when he came back, the Soviet Union basically said, hooray, you're a hero. You're never going to fly again because it's way too dangerous and we wouldn't want you to die. And so they basically just put him on tour for about three or four years where that was all that he did. And he was very frustrated because as, a, as an astronaut, uh, he wanted to fly more missions and do more things. And he would see these other people going up and doing more and more things. And he wanted to do it as well. So he started to work back to the point of being an astronaut. And part of that is pilot training. So he was out um, flying with uh, another pilot and they were doing some maneuvers and there was some bad weather and the plane crashed. And so Gagarin was actually killed in a plane crash just, I forget exactly when, but it was in the late sixties, just as the sort of moon race was coming to its, uh, its, its climax. So it was a big blow to, to Soviet prestige and, um, also just a sad thing, you know, someone who is trying to get back to his, his career and uh, has an accident like that. So alas, no. However, there are many uh, of the early cosmonauts and the early American astronauts still around and kicking. I saw a thing with um, some of the Apollo astronauts just the other day, Jim Lovell, who was, uh, you know, Apollo 13, the Tom Hanks character, he's 90 this year. So, uh, but he's still going on tour and telling stories and things like that. And of course, there are new astronauts that are, you know, in the prime of their career. And there are kids out there who will be astronauts who are who just don't know it yet. So there you go. Okay, and now we have got a question from Facebook. Are there any other names for the Big Dipper? Oh, yes, there are many names for the Big Dipper. In fact, there are probably as many names for the Big Dipper as there are cultural groups in the world because not everybody used dippers, you know, at various points in their in their um, development. Um, even today in England, they call it the uh, the plow or the wagon, the wain, actually, because it kind of looks like a. Well, I guess this would be the wagon part. The wheels would be on this side, so it's sort of upside down. Oh, you can't see my mouse. There we go. So here's the uh, the, the the bowl would be the wagon. The wheels would be sort of up here, and then this is the long harness that you would hook up to the horses. Um, and the same thing if you if you considered it a plow, it would be that kind of uh, of view. Um, other cultures, uh, the Anishinaabe people of Manitoba have referred to it as the fisher because it looks kind of like a well, kind of like a weasel, actually, a little long animal with uh, with sort of legs here and a long tail. And, um, you know, so that's a, that's another way of looking at it. The, the Greeks say it was the, the great bear. This does not look like a bear. Sorry, ancient Greeks. I apologize, but uh, just doesn't work for me. And, uh, yeah, so there, there's a whole bunch of different potential names for it. Great question. Yeah, great question. Yeah, okay, let's go back to Zoom. Just a, a quick question coming from Kaylee. Uh, she just wants to be reminded, what time does Yuri's Night start, the Yuri's Night online event? Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's 6 o'clock Central Time. So if you go to yurisnight.net, that'll have all the details there. But yeah, 6 o'clock our time is when it's scheduled to start. It is an international Zoom and uh, online event, so there may be some technical glitches, but should be a should be a good program. 
All right, we're uh, going to go way back into the chat for this next question, and uh, I'm sure you're going to be able to fit this answer in in the next uh, minute or two. Uh, but Ryan is on Zoom, and his kids were wondering, how are planets made? Go. Oh, good. How are planets made? Okay, I'm going to do use an analogy because the details are very detailed, shall we say. But have you ever gone out on that, perfect wintry day where the snow has fallen and it's like perfect snowball weather so you got that really nice wet sticky snow okay take a tiny little bit of it make a little snowball like an inch across and then put it down on top of the fresh snow and start rolling it and the snow sticks to it and it gets bigger and then as you keep rolling that thing it gets bigger and bigger and eventually you can make a giant snowball right you can make something so big you can't even lift it that is effectively how planets were made because originally space wasn't empty the space around the sun was all full of dust and rocks and um, gas and all sorts of tiny tiny little bits and gravity gravity is a force that likes to pull things together so if you have maybe a little bit of rock over here that's a little bit bigger it will have a little bit more gravity and so it'll pull other things toward it and when they pull and they hit they'll sort of stick just like the snow sticks to the snowball and once it sticks it's a little bit bigger so it has a little bit more gravity and as it's going around the sun other things are bumping into it and sticking and so on and it's just building up it's snowballing just like the snowball that you're rolling around in the snow all this stuff is sticking together and if you do that long enough you can build up not just a snowball but a a, a rock ball i guess the size of a planet and that's how the planets were were formed we think of course nobody was there at the time to you know take pictures or whatever but that's that seems to match everything that we see about um you know, the, the craters on the moon and those kinds of things, they all sort of fit together to, to give us the evidence to, to make us think this is the way planets were made. All right. That wasn't too bad. All right. Um, question also well, from uh, Ashley on uh, Zoom, uh, asking about your recommendation for where to go outside the city to look at stars and planets. They've tried their uh, telescope in their backyard, but... Uh, they got light interference and can only see things high up in the sky. Uh, any recommendations from you, Scott? Yeah, you know, um, you don't have to go far to get away from those lights. You really just have to go just outside the city. Um, I mean, a few minutes outside the perimeter will usually get you away from the lights enough that you've got a, a, a much better view. Like when I, when I head out of the city, um, I'll usually go to a place that's, I don't know, like five, 10 minutes outside um, I've gone to La Barrier Park. That's a great place. It's, it's um, you know, got a parking lot and, you know, some facilities and things like that. So that's a good spot. Uh, Beaudry Park, Birds Hill Park, any of those are, have, been, uh, have been good. But you really don't need um, anything special and you really don't need to drive too far. The best thing, though, is you, you just got to go somewhere where you can park safely and you know you're not on private property. You're not... Um, too close to the road so someone's kind of you know, crash into you or something like that you just need to be sort of safe and in a secure kind of place but really any spot will do As i have in the past pulled over on the side of the road where there's like a um on some of the farm roads they'll have these little sort of indentations that that's where the farmers would take their tractors into the middle of the field it's not a road but it's just sort of a wide part of the shoulder that sort of stretches across the ditch there's usually enough space in a spot like that that you can get off the road still not be on the farmer's field and have a little bit of space to set up so anything like that can really work all right excellent seeing lots of comments that people liked your analogy for the planet formation uh ryan Good. responded that uh, his kids said he, that they liked how you explained it so uh, i think that worked nice. out really well um I guess one last question from Mike on Zoom, wanting to know if you know anyone who would want to volunteer to go to Mars. Uh, and he's even asked if any of our listeners uh, have ever volunteers or would volunteer to go to Mars. You know, I have a number of people that I would volunteer to send to Mars. Um, <laughs> 
not uh, I'm not going to name any names for obvious reasons, but uh, I mean, the the thing about a trip to Mars, it's not a vacation. It's not um, a short mission to go to Mars with humans. You're talking a three year trip. It, and there's there's no way to really shorten that. It's about an eight month trip to get there, and you can only launch when the two planets are at their closest point. As they go around the sun, Earth is going faster and Mars is going slower, so they they get out of synchronization. And every 26 months, they all come into the same spot where we're kind of as close together as we can be. You launch, then you get there, you land. Now you have to wait two years before that alignment comes back, so that you can come back. So you have to go there and stay for two years. Now, if you if you remember the picture of um, Yuri Gagarin's spaceship that we uh, that we saw, or even the space shuttle, we're not talking a lot of space. We're not talking um, comfortable kinds of accommodations, and so you really need to be um, able to deal with that kind of kind of issue and the isolation. I mean, even if you have a, a big spaceship or even if you have a, a, a base that's been set up there in advance, it's you and three or four other people and you won't see anybody else for three years and you won't be able to go outside. Or if you go outside, you'll be in a spacesuit. You won't be, you know, feeling the grass between your toes or breathing the fresh air or anything like that. You'll be eating the same few kinds of foods for three years because there's no variety and there's no stores to go to to pick up something different. You'll be recycling all your own water, all your own water. Um, so it's not exactly the most attractive trip right now. Having said that, there are piles of people who have already volunteered to go to Mars. There are a few programs where they're doing simulations where they're basically putting people in a in a bubble for long periods of time and sort of seeing how they react and, and seeing what kinds of problems they might face. And there's no end of people signing up for that. And just like the people that, uh, you know, got on a ship from Europe and came across the ocean, not knowing where they were going or what they were going to do when they got there, I'm sure there will always be people who would be willing to take even a one-way trip if there was at least some hope of of um, infrastructure being there. You've got folks like um, uh, Elon Musk. He wants to send a million people to Mars to be able to, so that you're not, you can get around that isolation. You can get, you can have an actual city there and, 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 uh, and settle the place. I could, I don't know if I could think of a million people I'd like to send to Mars, but uh, I could certainly take a stab at, uh, at a couple of dozen people that I would, I would be happy to get off this planet. But it, it sounds really cool, but I think it would be, it'll take a special kind of person to do it. On the, on the other hand, I would go into orbit in a heartbeat. If I could buy a ticket to just go up into space for like half an hour and come back, I, I'm there. Um, still a little pricey. How about you, how about you Mike? Are you, uh, you willing to go to Mars? I don't know if I'd uh, want to do that. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, of course, lack of, of interest of wanting to go to another planet. Uh, it's, it's really just, uh, you know, the, the journey there would be very challenging and I just don't think that I'd be up for it. I think there are a lot of other way more capable human beings uh, that would be better suited to go to Mars than I would be. Yeah. Well, they do apparently want, uh, astronauts to have some level of, you know, training and skills and all that kind of stuff. I, I applied as, as a Canadian astronaut the first time they asked, um, and they were looking for people with pilot experience or doctors or whatever. I was uh, 11, I think, and they didn't take me for some reason. Um, I applied the next three times and they still didn't take me uh, I, because I never learned to fly or scuba dive or do heart surgery or, or that kind of thing. But uh, the last time I was, when they asked a few years ago, I was going to apply and my kids said, dad, we don't want you to go into space because we'd be scared. It's like, okay, so I, so I didn't apply. Not that I would have got in anyway, it's not really the point, but it, you'd really have to be able to cut your ties to this planet completely and just go to Mars and Mars would be your home forevermore and that would be it because there's just no way to get back and forth in a, in a timely fashion. So if you're interested in going, 
if you're interested in going to Mars, uh, drop something in the chat and let us know. I'd love to know. I'd love to see, um, you know, how many people would uh, would take a trip like that. To be quite honest. And uh, looks like our final question uh, coming from Facebook. Uh, question is: Is George going to stop by tonight? Uh, George is actually not feeling all that well. He uh, he got into some of the garbage earlier this evening, and oh, so yeah. he's. <laughs> Yeah, he's not feeling very well, so I didn't want to pick him up and bring him down here. In fact, I didn't really want to be anywhere near him right now. But um, he's resting, and I'll I'll try and bring him in uh, again uh, for for a future show. He uh, he does like to come down here when I'm working, so hopefully he'll uh, he'll drop by again for uh, for another show. I'll tell him you said hi. Just to clarify, George, uh, for those of you that I uh, haven't uh, seen uh, past episodes, uh, George is is one of Scott's cats. Or yes. You only have the one. Yeah, cat, correct? that's yeah. right. Just the one. Uh, not, yeah. not one of his children. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, I realize, you know, you sort of you, you we've built this community here where people have been watching since the beginning and they they know all the in jokes and they know all the references and things like that. And so you you forget sometimes that, you know, new people are joining all the time and, and you know, coming to learn about the sky and they might not know what the heck we're talking about. So we'll yep. try and be open and uh make sure that everybody uh, understands. Vivian uh, just posted, uh, hi Vivian, uh, not going to Mars, not at all. Yeah, that's kind of where I am at this point. If I was younger, if I was single, if I was, I don't know, I'm, I, I would have considered it in the past, but now, yeah, not so much. All right, well, this brings us to the end of our program for today. We will be back next week. And next week we have, um, we're coming into a great period of time to see the International Space Station beginning uh, after next week. And so we're gonna talk about the space station, how to find it, what it looks like in the sky. And actually it turns out to be the 50th anniversary of space stations because the very first space station was launched 50 years ago next week. So we'll be talking about space stations, plus of course, the constellations, the planets, and any upcoming celestial events. April has been a little quieter in the first half, but things start to get rolling. We've got a lot more events to talk about. And uh, we are getting into the dark of the moon over this next week. The moon is, is very uh, close to new. This is the time to get out of the city and look, look at the stars because when the moon is out of the way, you've got that source of light gone as well. And so you can get to see really faint things. You can see the Milky Way. If you're lucky, you might see some Northern Lights. And uh, it really is a great time to get out there before the mosquitoes come. If you're, if you're a new Manitoban, you may not have met the mosquito yet. The mosquito is our provincial bird. And um, they, uh, they love astronomers because we're out at twilight when they like to come and feed. And so they, don't, they, they aren't out yet. We've got a few weeks before that happens. Oh, uh, Vivian's asking about Ingenuity. Yes, Ingenuity is supposed to fly this weekend, although we don't know for sure. The, the Mars helicopter will be doing its first test flight uh, as of April 11th or later. So it could be tomorrow, could be the 12th, um, but it could also get delayed. We'll hopefully be able to bring you some video from that flight next uh, during our next show if they've gone ahead. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's where we are with that. We'll, uh, yeah, we talked about uh, what we have next week. And so try and get out, check out the sky, try to avoid, uh, stay warm. If we do get snow this weekend, that's obviously going to get in the way of our observing. But uh, drop us a line, fill out the survey so that we know what you'd like to see in the future. And we'll see you all next week for Dome at Home. Thanks for coming, everybody. and Have a great evening.